brief overview of what it is that you do for other people. Your name. No, Your I'm just... name. <laughs> My name. <laughs> Pop quiz. <laughs> I'm Monica Wofford, and I'm the CEO of Contagious Companies, but also a professional speaker by trade. You wouldn't know it, but I've been speaking for the last 24 years, just since I was six. In the context of Contagious Companies, what we do is we focus on developing leaders, often out of those managers who were promoted, but maybe not prepared. So we help people lead themselves better and lead others far more effectively and productively. Beautiful. Wow, that's nice and succinct. <laughs> and I gotta tell you, I've had some past bosses which who really needed your help. Uh, were they promoted but not prepared? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> or at least that's what you're going to say. That's your story. You're sticking to it. That's my story. <laughs> it probably wasn't them. They were probably just different. <laughs> there, there are two different kinds of different. One is really different. You know, Jack Russell, German Shepherd, different. Yeah. And then there's, if you remember Saturday Night Live, there's Church Lady, different, special. Aren't they special? special. <laughs> Yeah. So you can look at it from both angles if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> if you would, describe your journey to this point. It's been a purposeful journey in hindsight, though I don't know that at any point I could have said, oh, this is the track we're on, this is on purpose. When I started that speaking or began speaking at 18, prior to that, for the years I was an officer, I traveled the nation giving training to different state delegations of DECA. And I didn't know it then, but that was the beginning of what is now a, a very strong training and consulting profession. I worked in retail from the time I was 15 until I was 26, so I learned how to be a manager and how not to be a manager. <laughs> Even <laughs> more importantly. All, yeah, all the mistakes I made in that time period are, are now in the 210 pages of Contagious Leadership, the first book I wrote. How not to mess up being a manager is what I should have titled that book. But I learned all the things not to do. And then someone figured out she's got 12 or 13 years as a retail manager at a very young age. And she's been speaking for at least that long at a very young age. Well, who knew? Why don't we put her in training, which I didn't even know what that was, to be quite candid. So the wireless industry headhunted me away from retail and I became a professional trainer and then was promoted about every year to the point that I was then responsible in the latter years of my corporate America career for about five call centers indirectly responsible for about 5,000 direct reports or indirect reports and the training they received in five different call centers in five states. And then I left in 03 and said, you know, I think it's time for me to do this on my own and opened Contagious Companies 10 years ago this year. Tell me a little bit about the jumping off point when you decided to start your own business. <laughs> Actually, I could start six months prior to that because would you like to know what I declared in my living room for all the world to hear? Sure. Six months prior to yes. leaving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I stood in my living room and said out loud and with conviction to several of my best girlfriends who happened to be over for a weekend get together. And one of which had just opened, I think, an Ameriprise franchise at the time, one of which had just started her own dental practice and, and several other professionals. And I was a uh, lower level executive in the wireless industry. And I, the comment was, you should go start your own business. <laughs> I will never leave corporate America. I like the 401k, the every other week paycheck, the vacations, the security, the certainty, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Six months prior to leaving, those were the words that flew out my mouth. And um, let's just say things change. <laughs> the, the story actually is that we had our first round of layoffs and I, I was not included in that set of layoffs. The, the belief I had at the time was that there must be something here to this. So I think it, it noodled around in my brain for a while. I processed it for a while. And what I said to myself is, if there is a second round of layoffs, because back then layoffs were still reasonably uncommon, particularly for this certain company. They didn't happen very often. And when the first one came, it was quite a shock. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, you know, on the off chance 
that we have a second round of layoffs, I will make myself scarce and go start my own company. Second round of layoffs came and I called up my boss and I said, we need to talk. And that was how I ended up leaving the organization is that I was able to be uh, a part of that layoff grouping and go on with the next chapter of my life. Awesome. And how many people do you have working with you now? Depends on how you count it. <laughs> we have trainers that work with us on a contract basis and coaches that work with us on a contract basis and a very strong and amazing team of individuals who, as I said earlier, it takes a village, mm -hmm. help this organization to help as many clients as we do. So between 12 and 16, uh, it's a small crew, but we serve clients worldwide from Brazil to Singapore. In fact, I'm leaving for Asia in a couple of weeks. And then also uh, clients such as Microsoft, SeaWorld, uh, as well as a host of other companies that you may or may not have heard of. What resonates most with those clients, with your audience in general? Results. Results. To my knowledge, we're the only training firm that can measure the impact of assessments and training on an individual. That through the core profile tool we use and that's in the book, Make Difficult People Disappear, and we can quantifiably show a CEO or director or VP on a graph how that behavior has moved from point A to point B from the time prior to the training, coaching, or assessment and the time after training, coaching, or assessment. Most of our clients are very, very focused on you know, training. That, that's great. That's nice to have. Show me the results. Mm -hmm. Show me an ROI for training. And I heard that so often in corporate when I was in corporate America that I sought out every opportunity to make that happen. So that's really what resonates with them. Wow, you're, you're the training firm? You mean you and Contagious Companies can actually measure that investment that we give you for training and what it's giving us back? Yeah, absolutely. And that's what they come back for. So what's the most fun part about what you do? Ooh, anytime I get to be in front of an audience. That's the part that, that lights me up. And for most people on the planet, that's the part that terrifies them, that stops them in their tracks, and for which they spend weeks worrying about what they're going to say. I, I have so much passion about leadership, and, and passion sounds like a, a cheesy, superfluous sort of description. I'm incredibly passionate about people learning how to lead more effectively. Not, not just other people, but lead the voices in their freaking head, for example. Uh, which is something I've often struggled with. Uh, they're talking right now. Huh? Just kidding. <laughs> the, so the time when I get to leave the office, go in a training class, provide a keynote speech, work with the client directly and see those results and the expressions on their faces and the interaction of those audience members, that's the part that lights me up. The rest of the running the business is important uh, and valuable and also fun, but when I'm really good, they let me out of the office to go train a class, and that's when I get very, very excited. <laughs> Not that you can tell. So are you more the entertainer? I have a lot of entertainer and a really well-developed entertainer personality preference, but it's also my secondary. I am very, very much that stereotypical type A driven, competitive, ambitious, occasionally controlling, demanding, and bossy when enough stress is put upon me. I'm the commander all the way. I arrived on the planet as a commander and spent about 25 years trying to be a relator because I got tired of being told I was too direct, um, which does nothing but make all that direct behavior come out even more. So yeah, the reason we bought the assessment tool we use is because it's the first thing in my life uh, nine years ago that gave me permission to be who I was. And then I mellowed and was just able to be that, which is a commander entertainer. That's my dominant and secondary preference. Nice. All right. Yay. Well, yeah. you and I you and I match up quite nicely. So uh -huh. you know, that That's, always I means get along so well. <laughs> well, it either means you're gonna get along well or it's just not gonna work at all. Typically when you put two preferences that are that are shared, in other words, let's say if a commander entertainer were to marry a commander entertainer, mm -hmm. you would have the occasional locking of horns because that commander likes to vie for control. So you need to clarify whose role is what so they can each have their requisite control. Mm -hmm. But there is also such a degree of common understanding that there is an overarching sense of synergy and harmony and you complete each other's sentences and you kind of speak in bullets. So you don't have to do as much work 
as you would if, say, you married your opposite, which is what most people do in their first marriages anyway. But this isn't a marriage seminar. <laughs> we could devolve into that, but we're not going to do that. <laughs> Another day. Right, right. You do a lot of speaking. Um, what's your creative process like for writing a speech? I pay attention to all the environmental things around me. I look for leadership lessons in some of the most unusual places. In fact, I have to warn people when I go to the movies. I'm a big movie buff uh, because when I go to movies, I will very often be in the theater on my phone with the brightness turned way down, taking notes. Uh, For example, Despicable Me, the first one, and a little of the second one, but the first one in particular, I took reams of notes in my phone texting myself because there were so many leadership lessons in that movie that I wanted to point them out. And the more avenues from which you can give people examples to access information that's already filed away in their brain, but that you can jog their memory or give them a different way to look at it, it allows them to retain that information and then act on it more effectively. The the creative outlets are sometimes movies, often books. I read about a book a week. And then, although this may sound odd, paying attention. I, I came up with a great analogy for being able to describe how a leader delivers their expectations to those who might be of different personalities through watching the dogs walk around my neighborhood. Uh, I mean, really? But the creative inspiration comes from dozens of places. It's a matter of being open to it, I think. You are, you have, um, wow, like the whole business thing going on, the whole creativity side, you're helping other people. I love, it's like the trifecta of jobs. Woo! Yay! Yes, hey, the... And I wake up every day excited to go to work. <laughs> oh, I know. I love that. Isn't that, that's the, the best. It is. Um, so what's your advice to people who are going out and living a creative life? If they're looking to live their creative life or their best life or do what they love, find a way to do it profitably. (laughs) That would be advice number one. And what that often means is hiring out those positions that you're not very good at. It, It took me years to let go of the minutia of the fiduciary calculations because I hate them, but as a charter card-carrying member of Control Freaks Anonymous, I couldn't let them go. But I think I held my business back for a number of years because there were certain things that I held on to. It it also, though, is recognizing what you do well Mm -hmm. and and what you don't. Because those people that are often very creative, that live in that right-hand side of the brain, aren't going to be the linear thinkers. They aren't going to manage the money well. They aren't going to create the processes. You say ops manual and they go bleh. So finding somebody who is linear, maybe to partner with or subcontract with or hire. Uh, And also remember that just because you stroke a check for something does not solve the problem. You often still have to figure out what was the source of the problem. And sometimes it was me, (laughs) but it's looking at just because you struck that check doesn't mean it's going to go away. You have to examine it, take action, and and be persistent and consistent. Those would probably be my sum total pieces of advice at the moment. So plug your book. Uh, If you have any difficult people. Not that any of you have any difficult people, but just on the off chance you have difficult people. There is a great book, and I say it's great because everybody keeps telling me it's great, called Make Difficult People Disappear. Now, I tried to get the editor to put the subtitle in that said dot, 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 without going to jail. (laughs) However, she wouldn't do it. But in this case, it's a great read. It's a story. It's all about Sybil which if you're old enough to remember that movie, you'll know right away it's about some personalities and people that are different, if perhaps Uh not difficult. But Make Difficult People Disappear is a tool, a resource, and a reference manual for you to be able to finally, and with finality, get rid of a lot of the stress that you associate with difficult people and maybe even see them as different. Autographed copies are available now at MakeDifficultPeopleDisappear.com. And if you hurry, you'll even get a set of Ginsu knives. Oh, awesome. (laughs) Very cool. (laughs) While you're out surfing, check out our website at TheTrailerTalks.com. I'm Cecily Korst. Join us for the next road trip. in the car and 
at home because I am told if you just lay the book, Make Difficult People Disappear, on the dining table, your whole family's behavior will transform magically. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I actually had someone put that on Amazon as a review. I was like, all right, really? <laughs> wow. Are you serious? Awesome. Yeah, that's 